Hi, I'm Steve Penny. Welcome to my series on the end times. This is session three. I'm calling this series Coming Ready or Not. And so the whole essence of what I'm saying is get ready. Time is short. And you can hear that in the first two sessions. But I, this session is built around the question, uh, and it's this, what are the major views or belief systems concerning the end times? And the, this is very important because your eschatology, your doctrine of end times affects your theology, your doctrine of life, living and godliness. So what you believe about the end times will affect the way you live now. And uh, that says a lot right there. People that deny we're in the end times, but the end times have been going for thousands of years, have certain flaws in the way they live now concerning the return of Jesus Christ to planet Earth. So let's get into it. There are three main views of the end times. There's what we call amillennialism or amillennialism, which means, and I'll explain all this in detail, means uh, no millennium, no thousand years. Then there's post-amillennialism, no literal thousand years, post-millennialism, no literal thousand years, and pre-millennialism, before the millennial reign, means there is a literal thousand year reign. Now, the key word in all this is millennium. It means literally a thousand years. That's what it means. And each view interprets differently the thousand year reign of Christ on earth and its relation to the second coming of Jesus. So this is very important. If it affects everything we believe and how we live, uh, how we view the end times, we better get it right. And so firstly, amillennialism, amillennialism means no millennialism, no millennial. It says this, we're in the millennial period now. This is the millennium. And it spans an unknown period of time from when Jesus first came to when he comes back a second time. And they say that it's, it's indefinite. We don't know how long it is, but that's, that's the millennial reign of Christ on earth now. And they declare, our millennialism declares, it's a spiritual reign of Christ in the hearts of true believers. He's reigning on earth through spiritual true believers. Post-millennium, the next one, is very similar. It says we're in the millennium now. And the second coming of Jesus will come after the, the millennial period is completed. And that's, a, uh, that's not a thousand years. That's just a period on earth. It's from the first coming of Jesus to the second coming. And it's God's kingdom reign on earth through the church. That, that one's very prevalent now. These two are. But then we come to pre the millennialism, which means that Jesus comes back and ushers in the second coming of Jesus will occur literally. He will then establish a 1,000 year millennial reign and it will be a literal reign of Christ with his wife, his saints on earth. And so they're very distinct and very different in their eschatological view of the return of Jesus. Now, you've got to put some things in context here, and that is that all three views can be contained within the general things that Christianity agrees on. Number one, they, we all agree, those three views agree that Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. He's the king over all things. Secondly, we all agree that Jesus rules and reigns and will rule over his glorious kingdom. We all agree that Jesus will one day return to this world literally, physically, visibly, and gloriously as the judge and ruler over all things. Okay, so let me 
hopefully not get too detailed. I'm trying to keep it simple, but this is the crux of what people believe about the end times is their view of where the millennial reign of Jesus sits at the end of the age. You take amillennialism, says it's not a literal comeback Jesus, reign for a thousand years. You take postmillennialism, where both believe the millennial reign is in the saints and through the church on planet Earth. That means you'd have to tack on from AD 2000, you'd have to tack on another thousand years for the seventh day of the Lord to reign. Then he comes back and bang, it's all over in uh, seven years and we're gone to heaven, whatever. That's not how the Bible presents to me. And so the differences that determine our view are millennialism means no literal thousand year reign of Christ. It's the present church age for however long it goes, maybe another thousand. They believe the kingdom, this is our millennialism, no millennium. They believe the kingdom of God is happening now from Jesus' first coming to his second coming. Their meaning of millennium is an, a long unspecified period of time that's inconsistent with every use of a thousand years in the Bible. Uh, they believe that Satan was bound at the first coming of Jesus and the church must now establish the spiritual reign of Christ on earth and build his glorious kingdom on earth. Now, listen, this is where we get the term that's used for the contemporary church, the kingdom now church. Our millennialism is the kingdom now view. And it's held by many present contemporary churches. In fact, most of the younger generation of leaders have been groomed in our millennialism, post-millennialism, that we're in the millennium and there's plenty of time. They that declare that Jesus, the reign of Jesus is happening now and being established in the world by the influence of a great church. That's why they they refuse to preach on end times because it's not their view. They don't believe it. That's why one young upstart leader of the contemporary church goes around and says, we could have 500 more years or even longer to get the job done. Because of this view, they will not preach on the end times, nor even encourage looking for the signs of the second coming. They urge us to keep busy building the church and pushing back all of the negative darkness and influences that stop great churches flourishing. Their gospel is the gospel of the church as the kingdom now being manifest instead of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and his glorious return as the kingdom builder in the last days. That's the amillennialists. The postmillennial view, they believe and are very similar to our millennialism. Their view is that the millennial period is from the first coming to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Their period, same, is for an indefinite, an undetermined period of time. Got plenty of time. Post-millennialists believe the church will Christianize the world during this present church age, thus preparing the world as a nice place for Jesus to return to. Just read your Bible, you'll see that's not true, but they believe it. The reign of Jesus is a spiritual, social and political reign and we must invade the seven pillars of society. This was a big teaching, sweeps the church every so often, and they've created seven pillars on which a society exists, and we've got to invade those, take them over and be leaders, Christianize them, and make the world a beautiful place. And then as we do, the church will usher in a golden era, a golden age by preaching a gospel of better days ahead for humanity. The church can either hasten or hinder the return of Jesus. We return it at the end of this indefinite age, 
by Christianizing our world and preparing it for Christ. Here, Jesus, we've built a beautiful house for you. But we can hinder this return of Jesus after an indefinite period of time by not building his church as a manifest kingdom now organization. Now, the problem with this view, post millennial and a millennial, is that a literal kingdom cannot be manifest on earth in human history until the king of the kingdom returns to rule and reign over his kingdom. Both amillennials and postmillennialists also refuse to admit that their plan and their gospel to Christianize the world and make it a better place is not working. It's not working. Even go back into the early church, and we'll talk more about this. Even with uh, in AD 313, when Constantine ushered the great edict, in, uh, at AD 300, uh, that Christianity was no longer a criminal offence against the might of Rome, the government, he decriminalised Christian worship, Christian life. And from that time, AD 300, they became the religion of the Roman Empire. And church and state began to work together. And uh, instead of church and state bringing Christianity to change nations, Christianity became a favoured status, working with the state and uh, it lost its power. Listen to me. In these days, beware of preachers that want to join church and state together. There's a reason why they shouldn't be in bed together, holding hands together, because they are two different kingdoms. One's a worldly kingdom. One is the kingdom of God on earth. And when they join together, one has to become subservient to the other and it loses the power thereof. And uh, after AD 300, the, the church lost its power, lost its passion, lost its zeal and became a weak, ineffective church until the end of the 1500s. And so they just became obsessed with the literal evidence of the kingdom through politics, through buildings, through programs, through princely kings called leaders and uh, trying to influence the seven pillars of society. Such a belief system has never brought the kingdom of God into reality. The kingdom of God will always be a spiritual kingdom in the hearts of men and women until the king returns and he establishes it visibly, powerfully to rule over all things. Do you get this? Oh, I think that little phrase that Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you so you can be with me. The kingdom, our people are saying, Jesus, we've come to prepare a place for you so you can be with us. It's not about God coming to earth. The seventh year of the millennial reign is a specific, is, is the last thousand years of God walking for seven days, a full week of his purpose on earth. And it's for a specific reason on earth. But then we go to heaven to be with him in the house and houses he's built for us. So those two views to me don't stand up. Uh, they don't have biblical uh, strength and I'm amazed how the church swings to some of these views and we have to deal with them in these days. And I, now we come to the pre-millennial view. This is the one I believe most strongly stands out in Scripture. It means that the things, the second coming of Jesus, therefore from the rapture, the, the time short before the rapture, rapture, tribulation, second coming, all that's one package to me. And we're in that season now uh, where the rapture happens is pre or mid. is It's not the real argument to me. We're in that 
And then comes the millennial evidence of the kingdom of God on earth. We're pre-millennial. Stuff happens before it. And so we believe <laughs> the millennial kingdom will be a physical and literal 1,000 year period when Christ returns visibly to rule and reign over the earth from his throne in Jerusalem. Now, this is important. The early church held this view. The church, every time there's a great revival, returns to this view. Whenever there's challenge and upheaval, they return to the view, Jesus is coming soon. And they, the early church held this view, the end time view, and uh, up until about the end of the third century, they were going gangbusters, persecution, scattering, no buildings. They just got on with the job of winning people one-on-one -on -one to Jesus to be a part of his church. And But it waned when Constantine, the great Roman emperor, issued the Edict of Milan in, 13, in 313, decriminalizing the Christian faith. He then became the patron of the Christian church. And the church was given favor and protection and prosperity, particularly to the priests and the leaders. They became big shots, very well looked after so that they would, you know, go hand in hand with the state, the emperor, the Caesar. And they made Christianity the religion of the Roman Empire. Problem is when the church prospered under this worldly favor, and protection, it soon lost its zeal and passion and changed its belief in the near return of Jesus and replaced it with our millennialism. We've got plenty of time. We're, we're favored to build big buildings, elaborate, ornate, ornate temples, the most brilliant. We can put on the best programs and choirs and orchestras and elaborate pieces of music and art and everything else. We're, we're, we're up there with the world. We can do it better. The only problem is they lost the fire and zeal and passion of the early church who, who had this pre-millennial view. Jesus could come back soon. When you replace that with this ah millennialism or post-millennial, we've got another thousand. You've got plenty of time. We don't know. Let's just keep doing a bigger, better, best. You lose the passion. And then when you get leaders that make a big deal about walking state and church together, you know you're being led by leaders that don't get it. I hope I'm being blunt enough because I'm a trumpet blower. I'm not a here to have little discussions on pedantics. I'm blowing a trumpet so you will listen. Ah, you take then 300 to 500, the church just got worse, bigger buildings and all ornate stuff, but it got worse. And then AD 500 to AD 1500, history calls it the devil's millennium. Church and state working together. Church trying to outdo the world in all of its nonsense, but there was no fire and it's called the dark ages. See, you gotta, you got to get a hold of this. Premillennialism teaches this period. Second coming of Jesus, with or without your belief in where you put the rapture, I don't care. The second coming of Jesus is nigh upon us and we have to preach it. It comes before the millennial reign of Christ on earth because His coming inaugurates the manifestation of His kingdom on earth. Jesus will visibly return. Love this. He's going to visibly return after a literal seven-year tribulation period of terrible judgment, wickedness, and judgment by God on Israel and a wicked world. And boom, at the end of that, Jesus returns visibly and stuff just goes down phenomenally on planet earth. So our premillennial view of the end times, let me give you some stuff I see 
as a premillennialist. Stuff's going down right now between the sixth and the seventh day. Here's number one, an increase in religious apostasy. Religion. Well, Ray, raise its ugly head and become dominant, threatening and ma malicious toward the people of simple faith. There'll be a great falling away from the truth. I'll talk more about that, how the gospel has been changed to suit a convenient generation with, with truth that is more about lifestyle than being living a life of surrender to God. Darkness and wickedness will increase. And in the midst of all of this turmoil, chaos, darkness, God will begin and is and has begun to shake all things so that He can reveal His unshakable, glorious church. It will be seen in these days. The glorious church, the radicals, the rebellious, those... Th those that won't fit the traditional, the remnant they're called in the Bible, will be despised by religion and opposed and persecuted by the world, but they'll be desirable to the lost in this generation. There's a turning around in, uh, the Bible has a little saying, I'm throwing this in, it's way off the track. But the Bible has a little saying, Jesus said, a little child shall lead them. And we're being led by a millennial generation. And they've grown up, they've got the best of everything. They're the, I call them uh, the smartest dumb people I know. They're so smart, they know everything, but they're dumb to the realities of truth. And, uh, but there's a new generation born after 2009, and what would you think, uh, Gen XYZ, the millennials, what do you think the next generation would be called? It's the alpha generation. And uh, I felt the Spirit of God say to me, watch this generation. They're only just going to high school now, but focus on them because even naturally, there's a return to some of the things of their grandparents, the good old values and uh, uh, mores and boundaries of a society that had definite gospel to it, not some quasi gospel with blurred lines. And so I, I want to prophesy in the middle of this, a little child shall lead them. There's a generation emerging that will be part of this end time glorious church. Watch them emerge, give them space, disciple them well, and they will arise to champion this generation, this season at the end of the age. Oh man, I love that. <coughs> Let me give you uh, the timeline of coming events. And as I said, I'm blowing a trumpet, not weaving a rug with every definitive little you know, well, you know, when do the dead in Christ rise up and when will the... And no, they're questions that I'm not particularly fixated on. I'm fixated on the fact we have a glorious church emerging in these dark days at the end of time and there is an, a, a people that need to wake up to what God's doing. That's what I'm into. So here we go with how I see it unfolding. We're in from 2020. Is, uh, the, we're in that season of the pre-rapture shaking of all things from 2020. We woke up in 2020. I prophesied 2012, seven years, seven good years. At the end of 2019, I'm preaching God shift, change of all things. Get ready, prepare yourself. And we wake up to the world being shaken by tyranny and everything else that goes with it. The pre-rapture shaking of all things. Now, the next prediction, as I believe and see and hear it, is before 2030, the rapture of the righteous will happen. Before 2030. 
That's how urgent this message is. And I'll live with it whether it happens on that date or not. I'm warning you, the end is near. I see it and dare to believe that it will be before 2030 or 2033 and a half, the rapture of the righteous. After the rapture, the seven year tribulation period and the rule of the Antichrist will immediately come into effect in that seven year period. And it will be a horrific period on planet Earth. You don't want to be here for that. And I preach and teach and dare to believe that the righteous will be taken out in that period. The second coming of Jesus at the end of that seven year period will then happen. Visibly, the kingdom comes. Then he will affect the Armageddon campaign. He'll put a hook hook in the jaws of nations, bring them to to, to uh, Israel, and there there will be a slaughter of wicked armies, devastate nations like the world has never seen. Then at the end of that period, the millennial reign of Christ, Satan will be bound for uh, a thousand years. Jesus will rule with a rod of iron in that thousand years as the reign of Christ. And then at the end of it, Satan will be loosed for a season. And the reason for the thousand years, listen closely, the reason that the seventh day of the Lord walking in human history from day, the first day, remember the first two, Adam to Abraham, the second two, God's family, second two, Abraham to Jesus, God's natural uh, kingdom on earth, his nation. And then the third season was from Christ to the second coming. That's the end of six days, 6,000 years. That was uh, God walking through his church on planet earth. But there's one more thousand years. There are millennialists and the post-millennialists They just tack it on and say, well, we've got another thousand years of the church age. Just keep loving the grace. Do whatever you want. No, no. That's about to finish. And the reason for that is Jesus comes back. He takes the righteous out. We'll talk about that maybe next session. What happens after the rapture when the righteous and the Holy Spirit are taken out? He takes the church out. Then they come back as the wife to rule and reign as his kingdom on earth. Manifest for a thousand years where every single person will obey the will of God by the rod of authority on planet earth. But at the end of it, so that thousand years is for God to show us it could have worked had you stayed true to my covenants, my promises, my law. It could have worked until sin abounded in the hearts of mankind. And so he looses Satan at the end of the seventh day, the 7,000 years, and and, uh, to prove the hearts of people. Even though you've lived a thousand years under righteous rule, If wickedness is in your heart, you'll run towards Satan. And they did for a season to prove those that weren't of the kingdom. And then it comes the great white throne of judgment where God judges Satan and the wicked, casts them into hell forever. And then the creation of a new heavens and a new earth. And then we go and live with Jesus in the eternal realm forever and ever. And listen, don't let people tell you what heaven's like. They don't know. I heard someone answering a question, will there be time in heaven? Of course not. We're in eternity, the eternal. Time is immaterial. Time was created with the the sun, moon and days and seasons and everything else. And that's part of our decaying history. There is no time in eternity. It's forever with the Lord. But little things like don't get off on tangents because you're you're trying to prove how much you know about what can't be known. Anyway, but what an incredible season ahead, this timeline. And I keep coming back to, hey, listen, it's not about every little 
trickery of Satan or everything that happens in the, in the, the tribulation or how will we live and buy and sell and the money. It's not about that. It's about preparing your heart for the front end of the second coming of Jesus, which is the rapture of the church, the righteous. Prepare yourself. Get yourself ready. Awaken yourself to the urgency of these days. And my question at the end of this message is again, who will go and tell them? Oh, they won't listen. Of course they won't. That's the mercy of God. Your job is to tell them who will go and tell them about the soon return of their Saviour as King of everything. Will you go? Father, today, let the Word of the Lord ring in our hearts. Awaken us. Energize us by the Holy Spirit to go and tell this nation and beyond. The Lord is coming soon. In Jesus' name, God bless you. Let's see you next time. Amen. 